92nd Street Y online media is made possible by a generous gift in memory of Christopher Lightfoot Walker, a longtime friend of 92Y's Unterberg Poetry Center and the Paris Review. This program, part of an ongoing collaboration between the Poetry Center and the Review, features a Writers at Work interview with Peter Matheson, who was recorded on December 15, 1997, before a live audience at New York's 92nd Street Y. It's hard to see. Um, I wanted just to clarify one thing very briefly, and that's, as Carl intimated, um, this is uh, part of an ongoing uh, series of conversations that Peter and I have recorded in many, many different places um, uh, over 10 or 12 years. And uh, so this tonight will be um, uh, just part of the uh, final Paris Review interview. And of course, one of the reasons um, you're here and we're here tonight is to um, celebrate the uh, second volume, Lost Man's River, of a trilogy of novels um, uh, surrounding the life of a uh, notorious figure, Edgar Watson. Uh, first uh, volume was, of course, called Killing Mr. Watson. And I think uh, it's best just to get on with it and jump right in and ask Peter about uh, that book uh, and about Lost Man's River and um, Edgar Watson, who holds all three volumes together. Uh, Peter, you first heard about Edgar Watson from your father while traveling in the uh, uh, backwater territories of Florida when you were a boy. I forgot how old you were exactly. Uh, and now, lo and behold, you found yourself spending 20-some years, uh, many years later, writing this, uh, these three volumes. Um, investigating uh, the mystery and life and times of this extraordinary character, rogue family man, uh, farmer, and probably most definitely himself, uh, a murderer. Backwards Florida, uh, having been one of, your, one of the landscapes of your childhood, when did you first uh, get the inklings or f any forebodings that you actually wanted to write about Watson uh, himself as a character? Before I answer that, I'd like to just, if there's anybody I know out there, uh, <clears throat> thanks for coming and good evening. The lights are so bright that there's no way we could identify you, so don't think that um, we're being unfriendly. Um, yeah, I first heard of, of Watson when I was about 17 years old. I was traveling up the west coast of Florida. That's a region called the 10,000 Islands. And that, in combination with the Everglades to the east, is the biggest a roadless area in the United States. We don't think of that being in Florida, but it is, and it still is uh, to this day. And he showed me a marine chart, my father, and said, this river, Chatham River, there's a house up there. It's the only house in the Everglades. And it belonged to a man named Watson, who apparently was a killer himself, but was executed by his neighbors um, in 1910. And that stuck in my brain, you know, a man executed by his neighbors, unless the neighbors are identified as being a rather violent nature or whatever, but these guys were apparently fishermen and farmers, and uh, to execute this neighbor struck me as odd. And then, not for many years, I was doing a, I was planning a novel kind of in my head about to be based in the Everglades. I love the Everglades, it's a fascinating place for me, and I know I've been, had a lot of experience with the wildlife and the birds there too, so I like that. And one of the most, un, at that time, untouched American Indian groups, the Miccosukee, were also there in the Glades too. They were the only ones that they were never beaten by the U.S. Army. They were beaten by the bureaucrats who they came out of hiding in about 1917 and found that they were legislated out of existence. But um, so all of these things came together, and I was going to make this Watson story kind of a thread in this whole business, but it, the thread took over like a strangler fig, which is a well-known tree down there, and um, it became the main story. It became so strong, all of its reverberations and the things that attached to it, the racism and uh, everything that uh, has to do with it. And I just became absorbed with the story, and I wanted to tell it from, and also because there was no 
truth I could hang on to. The only really hard facts were on the gravestones. And um, there were census records and a few newspaper accounts, but mainly the story of Watson was completely, it was myth, sort of turning into a Florida legend, and it's still going, and it's still disputed down there. Did these people execute him, or did they act in self-defense, and so forth? And what sort of man was he? It is known that he was a, a near genius farmer. He was very, very good indeed, and his strain of sugarcane is probably the strain which became, I'm sorry to say, the big sugar sugar cane that is now wrecking the Everglades. So it's a rather ironic um, circle of events there. But uh, anyway, there were many, <laughs> many aspects of this story which, which, which drew me, and not least of them being that, by rumor at least, and there's a good deal of basis for it, the first man to shoot in a group of about over 20 men who met him at this landing in the dusk of an October evening, uh, the first man to shoot was a black guy. And if you know your history in America, 1910, and Jim Crow law, the very possibility of this is so extraordinary that a man would even lift a rifle against somebody like Watson, let alone pull the trigger. And yet, this may very well have happened. Do you, do you remember, though, um, when you first put pen to paper about with this book? Was it really 20 years ago? or It was 20 years ago when I started taking notes, my first notes, yeah. In fact, a lot of my, I, 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 I interviewed everybody over 95 in Southwest Florida, and including a few who actually remembered uh, Mr. Watson. And unfortunately, a lot of my informants have died off before they ever saw the result of their uh, cooperation. You know, for me, having, having been apprised of this book and reading drafts and so forth, and that day I was out at your house and saw that photograph, the one known photograph, the very, very haunting uh, mm -hmm. thing. How did you run across that? Um, Watson had relatives in northern Florida in Lake City. His sister lived there. And he, in fact, he married three times, and all three of his wives came from there. And he lived about half of his life there. And uh, <clears throat> these cousins, who wouldn't speak to me at first until I was interviewed in the paper, and I said, Watson was not a serial killer at all. He wasn't that sort of stunted mentality. He was a very well-liked guy, even by his wives and children, even by the people who shot him. Uh, very charming, good storyteller. But I said that he was not <clears throat> in any way a serial killer. And naturally, the local paper put it in. And I said he was a serial killer, which completely by accident smoked out these cousins who wouldn't talk to me. They wrote a very irate letter, said, we'll, if you come and see me, I'll straighten you out about it. If you'd known Uncle Edgar, you would have known that he was very generous and this and that. And uh, I was amazed just by the, for the wrong reason, I was invited into the family hearth. And when I walked in, there was this big picture on the wall of a man and a young girl and an old lady. And uh, I knew at once it was him. My yeah. jaw dropped and they said, yes, that's uh, Edgar Watson. Amazing. Amazing. And I was able to show that to other members of his family who had never seen it a picture of him because the scandal was so extraordinary. You can imagine 1910 to have a man shot to pieces, 33 bullets. That's a thorough job. And um, they uh, just covered it up. Some of them changed their name, but in 1910, that wasn't a good thing. One of his daughters was married to the president of the First National Bank in Fort Myers. So they were a very well-established family uh, when this happened. You're in the middle, actually, of, of the, or really the beginning and toward the middle now of the, of the publication of Lost Man's River, and you've been uh, touring around a little bit with the book, and uh, under the auspices of this being in part a, a craft interview and a, an interview about uh, the writing life, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think most writers would agree uh, that, that uh, a writing life is a great life and a very tough business, and um, uh, to be blunt about it, um, the reviews that I've seen uh, of Lost Man's River have been quite extraordinary. And let me quote um, from the San Francisco Examiner very recently. Lost Man's River stands alone without in any way duplicating Killing Mr. Watson, the first volume, and at the same time deepens the tale of the killing and its limitless reverberations. Mystery is the essence of Matheson's continuing saga. It is the essence of fine art, of great beauty, of existence itself. Um, hard to top that, I would say, Peter, but 
What's your sense, uh, having had a long, uh, ongoing, long writing life, of uh, the world now of, of, of putting a book out, um, the backing of, of, of a publisher, particular moment as this, which is very integral and very urgent when a book comes out, especially, perhaps especially one that um, you've been working on for so very long. And maybe um, segue a little, perhaps, if you would, into uh, a couple of thoughts on um, your sense of, or even advice, to uh, writers coming up now. This is a very, very tough world to come mm -hmm. into. It is. Um, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought we, Howard and I were talking about this earlier. I feel very lucky because we are, we have enough history in publishing now and being published that the publishers will, up to a certain point at least, take care of us and publish us. But for new writers coming up, it's really quite scary. Everything is so bottom line. And uh, I've never, I did a book tour this year, but I've never done a book tour in 25 books. I've never done one. I, I finally had to knuckle under it, <clears throat> eat my spinach this year. Uh, but it's because the, the, the financial pressures or the alleged financial pressures and for, for whatever reason. And as Howard uh, pointed out, um, the publishers really, what they really want, they want confessions and they want the history of your child abuse and things like that. Uh, and they sort of actually have the nerve to say to young writers, well, turn this into nonfiction and we'll publish it because <laughs> you write very well, but novels are having a hard time. Uh, getting published, and uh, it's partly the publisher's own fault. They gave these enormous advances to very third-rate books for a long, long time, published too many books. Now they're kind of recouping, like everybody else. Uh, but for a young writer coming up, it's a discouraging uh, business. Very, very few places to put short stories, and um, and getting a novel published is quite a feat. Well, you've seen, you know, in different phases of the publishing world since you were first publishing. Uh, First novel was written in in Paris, right? Um, no, the first novel was written here, here and, and then, then the second one. Second one in Paris, Paris so going back. In those days, in those days, writers were we were just swine to be pushed around. You, you had <laughs> you had no control. The publisher just owned you, kind of. He told you where to go. And I remember, <laughs> I'll never forget it. I was camped on the coast of Oregon, Tillamook, Oregon, and I I was doing a book called Wildlife in America. And I ran out of reading material, and it was pouring with rain. I had to drive 25 miles to a little town called Tillamook, which I assumed would have one of those spin-around book racks. I'd find something and get a little gray hamburger and go back to my tent. Well, the gray hamburger was there, and so was the spin rack. And there on the spin rack was a little novel, a very dangerous-looking jacket. It had a young woman lying in bed and a guy sitting on the edge of the bed taking off his shoes. But then another... <laughs> fellow was at the, at the foot of the bed, fully dressed in tie, with his, and I thought, this is pretty gamey. I better take a crack at this in my tent. So I lugged this little book all the way back to 25 miles. It was a 50-mile round trip for that hamburger in this awful little book. It was called Underbelly of Paris or something like that. And um, on the second page, I opened the book, and it said this book was originally Partisans by Peter Matheson. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the rudest surprise I ever had. I hurled it out. <laughs> Local publishing industry. The rain. I never heard about this book, let alone about the change <laughs> of title or anything. And there was no such scene in the book. Let me rest a <laughs> Hasten to say. <laughs> Peter, um, Elias Canetti said, and I quote, you should read your contemporaries as well. You can't get nourishment from roots alone. I'm not sure if you agree with that to begin with or not, but, but if you want to attend to it, do you feel uh, connected to uh, and derive in any particular literary sense a nourishment from the writers of, uh, say, your generation? I mean, um, you, uh, the most individual of writers, uh, do you feel connected to writers of your generation, and perhaps who do you feel most is writing most compellingly now? Well, Put you on the spot no, a little I think bit. There's, there's a lot of wonderful writers around, including this one here. I should mention about Howard that those 
two novels of his were both shortlisted for the National Book Award. Uh, not very many people can say that, including me. My first three novels were disasters, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so the, he's a very distinguished writer indeed, and there are many, many of Howard's generation, and the one older than that, and the one younger than that. I don't read all that number. And I have a, a kind of a, I mean, I know who I like. I think Don DeLillo is an absolutely superb writer, and, and uh, Robert Stone is a wonderful writer. Louise Erdrich is another one. Cormac McCarthy at his best is terrific. I mean, there's just so many out there. Uh, Jim Salter, another one. There are just lots of very, very good writers. And, um, but I don't, and maybe somebody's gonna rub my nose in it, but I don't see their influence on my stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't, certainly don't borrow anything that I know about. I may, it may just sort of seep in. I mean, I've been told by critics that, um, <laughs> well, Melville wrote this first, or, <laughs> of Faulkner, but I, I, I didn't see it, or at least I'd conveniently forgotten it anyway. And, uh, I, I don't see that direct influence, and I, and I, but I'm sure it's, it's there. I love to read. I've always been a, a great reader since I was a little boy. And yeah. Do you remember who it, for, her, for her first hit you hardest in, yep, in your reading? Yeah, I do. I, the, the two writers that really knocked me out when I was in my, I guess, teens were Dostoevsky and Conrad, mm -hmm. those two. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. But, but there's so many others which yeah. are well, who are wonderful. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. But you, I remember once we were talking, you talked about the fact that the, the generation really just before yours who had experienced the war and that that was very much, you know, a presence when you were in Paris and when you were thinking about that generation's yeah. writer. I mean, yeah. not that that's uh, the only distinguishing factor between those two generations, but it is one. Well, they were only, you know, they weren't that much older because I, I was on the, sort of the tail end of yeah. the world. But Styron and Mailer and that generation, Jim yeah. Jones and those people were, you know, a few years older than I was, but they weren't a whole decade yeah. older. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, you've said uh, in that you consider yourself in part um, to be a eulogist uh, for disappearing wildlife and to some extent um, in your writings about traditional peoples and cultures. And when you said that, I was very struck by that term. Uh, and I wondered, I mean... It, did I, did it, I mean eulogist or elegist? <clears throat> Maybe elegist. I think elegist. Uh, but but yeah. it's, you know, that's becomes that yeah. for some, in some instances. Well, it does. I, I think that uh, I would like my kids and my grandchildren and people to to see what was there and to see what we've, we've sort of dispensed with for their generations, which makes me extremely sad. You know, my American Indian pe friends that I work with, and they always talk about the seventh generation, that it's not good for the seventh generation after yours. It's not good, period. And we don't seem to care about that. We're willing to just, you know, plow up everything for making more money. And, and I think this is a great pity. So I would, I would like to record what the land looked like and what the wildlife, the abundance of the extraordinary new world abundance. We can't even f think in those terms anymore. And now we are dealing with a really very serious uh, problems, I think, and uh, we haven't still faced up to them. Look at the backing and filling going on in Kyoto when there's no question what we ought to do, you know. But we won't because we put people in office who are more concerned with getting elected than they are with the welfare of our country. And that this isn't only true here, it's true all over the world. I don't want to get up on my soapbox, no, but, you, but I, do you, want to write, I do want to write about those things. And traditional people, there's wonderful things that traditional people know and have known for thousands of years. And that traditional people are being pushed right off the map. And that would include, for example, the local fishermen where I live out on the end of Long Island. I mean, that old fishing culture has been there for 300 and some years, and now it's being eliminated. There's no room for them in, a, in the Hampton economy. And, and Men's Lives, the book that you yeah. published, is, is about that. But you, you have, um, I mean, from Wildlife in America to Under the Mountain Wall, quite a ways back, I've attended to these things. And I think of uh, Choran's phrase, the horror and ecstasy of life experienced simultaneously as though within the same moment. And you've wis witnessed a lot of the more severe transitions uh, in, in wildlife and traditional ways of life. Um, you've joked 
or, or sort of jokingly called yourself the, the gray old man of the green movement at, at, on, a, on occasion. And I didn't say gray. Yes, you did. No. Gray, gray. No, I didn't say gray. That. Gray, gray old man. Gray. Gray. Oh, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, yes. yes. Yeah. Are you, um, where do you, <laughs> we've talked so many and times. Here. I, I can, um, are you, this is a difficult question though. Are you, where do you invest your optimism, um, where do you see any significant signs of encouragement now um, in terms of these issues, especially in terms of wildlife uh, now? Is it in conservation groups? Is, do you there, see any? No, there are lots of, there are lots of uh, encouraging signs, but they're all small victories, and the overall tendency is still, uh, I don't mean to be, be gloomy, but I'm, I'm afraid that's true. I, I, think, I think we'll pull out of it. Uh, I hope we pull out of it before there's nothing left but rats and men and mosquitoes, but um, <laughs> uh, I think we really haven't faced up to it, even though many individuals are, are behaving extremely well, and, and there are certain wonderful local victories. Right here in New York, the Hudson River is in a great deal better shape than it was even 15 years ago, and you can point to things like that that are starting to happen. That's good. I just wish it would accelerate more and that we would be tougher on pollution and on these uh, yeah. corporations which seem to consider the bottom line everything, um, even at the risk of our health. And, yeah. I want to um, return a little bit to writing and um, talk about some of the, a little bit about the future. Um, I was thinking of a comment, and I jotted down a comment uh, uh, Norman Mailer made, um, actually in a Paris Review interview, where he says, writers who lack the courage to risk the unknown settle for craft. What are they afraid of, of discovering something ignoble in themselves? And I think about some of your books that, um, not that you've discovered something ignoble, but I think about the exper almost experimental nature, if you will. That's, that's not the right phrase for it, but I think of a book like Far Tortuga and the extraordinary um, amount of thought that went into the form and uh, to uh, not even remotely coming close to any uh, uh, traditional aspect, really, of, of, of literature. Um, where now uh, do you see some of your intellectual and aesthetic and literary uh, curiosities and investigations uh, taking you. You're, you're amidst, I, I believe, a, a book on um, the uh, cranes of the world, and I think that includes tigers as well. You're writing about tigers too, yeah, right? Tiger, yeah, tigers. Tigers and cranes. But I mean, and, and, and maybe just chat a bit about what's, yeah, what's I've, forthcoming. Um, even, even while I've been doing this long, um, it's really one immense novel that had to be broken up for, so the publishers wouldn't kill themselves. <clears throat> it was so long. But all this time, I've also been doing environmental things, working with American Indian people and doing those. I've been doing nonfiction books, too, and even one book of short stories. So this hasn't been a uniform uh, progression. And one thing I've been working on is a book on cranes. And there have been a number of crane pieces in The New Yorker and Harper's and Audubon and places like that. And uh, I'd like to make a book out of that and make it make the cranes kind of a metaphor for wilderness and water and clean air and earth and everything. Because cranes are, as you know, they're the biggest flying birds on earth, and they're very beautiful, extraordinary voices, and they demand a lot of territory. They demand a lot of most species of do, and most of them are in trouble. There are 15 species, and I think of 11 of them. You'd have to say were threatened and several of them seriously threatened. So I wanted, to, I wanted to see them, and it was a way to get to uh, wonderful regions of Siberia and Mongolia and China uh, to see these cranes. Uh, so I, I worked and, on that. And, Korea. And, and meanwhile, yeah. I'm working with tigers a little bit too. So. <laughs> yeah. This seems to me a very, very inimitable Matheson sentence. I'm also working with tigers a little bit too. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm not, just, other just, people are working <laughs> with tigers and I'm observing, <laughs> I should say. But I remember you talking about the, uh, the uh, it's a sort of the sort of DMZ zone there between North and mm -hmm. South uh, Korea and uh, uh, seeing cranes um, 
Yeah, Korea is kind of in, in the paper now, but we, we did go to Korea. You remember the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, and it's one of the most heavily armed. It's one of the spookiest places on earth, these huge loudspeakers broadcasting propaganda and mines everywhere, and armed soldiers who are extremely touchy and like to shoot at each other. And, um, <clears throat> but it became kind of by accident. It's, it's a wildlife preserve 149 miles long and about six miles across. It goes all the way across Korea because it includes about the only unshoot up land left in Korea, ironically, surrounded by barbed wire. There's this little strip of land between the two Koreas with quite a lot of water. And two of the rarest species of cranes that were, probably were flapping over and they looked down. So that's one place they're not shooting at each other. <laughs> they went down and um, occupied it. So now it's a very, very valuable wildlife preserve and we're trying to do our best to encourage the Korean people not to put more condominiums or car factories in there. Yeah, um, yeah. In a way, the cranes are benefiting from this uh, financial crisis in the Koreas. <laughs> so it might stick around a few years longer. But the, you, you sort of, you revisited some of these species though. I mean, it, mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't all seeing all of them for the first time. No, you, you some of them I've seen number, before. Number, yeah. Yeah, 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 in Africa and so yeah. forth. Yeah, yeah. And we have two here, of course. Yeah. Um, Peter, there's a couple of things that, believe it or not, that I haven't asked you over the years, and so I'm going to do it tonight. And so they, they, they get very, in some sense, very personal. Um, and and I, I can't remember where this quote comes from, but it's along the lines of it, it is. Uh, talking about writers, it is enough for a man to tell a story. He must tell it in order to be released from life's order, and only then can he die in peace. I think it may have been somebody as uh, uh, controversial or, or uh, as Celine. Um, in in all these years of your writing life, has 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 that been an experience of yours that that writing is whatever he meant by this, a release from, from life's order, or has it, it been, in a way, an ordering of, of life or ordering of your well, life? I think, it's an, I think it's an ordering of life, which is otherwise you know, very confusing. I, I think that's what all art is, is really to try to make something out of the chaos of existence that stands for that, and I like the story. I'm all for telling stories. I mean, we all love stories. We love gossip, we love jokes, we like little plots on the TV and in the films. And I think any writer who isn't telling a story is taking their work in their hands. I mean, I think it's kind of risky not to avoid that. I'm not talking about plot. Plot and story are very different, but there should be an underlying story which seizes, seizes people. And they're great fun to tell, and they have to be told well. You know people who tell jokes badly. Uh, it's, it's really <laughs> dismaying if you know a real good joke and somebody's hashing it up. Well, the same is true of, a, of any sort of story like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're fun to form, to, you sculpt them in a way. How's the best way to tell it? I've always wondered though, I mean, that, and, and this would be awkwardly put, but um, your writing has brought so much to so many people, but there's always the ongoing question of what it brings the writer. I mean, what writing brings to, what sustains you in that very, very difficult craft and very difficult enterprise. Um, there have been times when um, you've been away from it and places you've traveled that you perhaps haven't written about and so on and so forth. And there's many other things going on in your life. But, you know, from, from that sort of aerial point of view or a philosophical point of view, I mean, it, it, is it that simply you feel that it was part of a fate to be a writer you've been writing from very early on. I can't remember when Sadie was first published, actually. College, yeah. You were about 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. um, and were you aware of it then? I mean, were you convinced from very early on, or even earlier in high school? Yeah, I, I, I knew from about the age of 15, I started writing very bad short stories. And, um, and the first one was published when I was in college, yeah, in the Atlantic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I always knew. I, I, I don't know how you know that. You just kind of know you do want to do it. Yeah. It's a disease. I remember a friend of mine used to, who was a novelist, and he used to teach out in California. And that's the first thing he'd say to his class. He'd say, if you could be anywhere else, you shouldn't be here. And uh, I, I, understand, I understand that. It's kind of a, 
compulsion. And I think it's why writers are kind of socially disorderly. There was a book that Malcolm Cowley did years ago. Called, I think it's called Writers and Their Writing. Yeah. And the incidents of social disruption and alcoholism <laughs> and divorce and murder and suicide and among writers is very, very scary indeed. And maybe not in other countries, but in this country. It was, I don't think he quite realized what he was getting into, but uh, he put this together. And I, think that, um, and I think that's what writing does. It restores your balance and your, your sanity some way from that chaotic. Uh, the ordering, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, I was looking back over our conversations over 10 or 12 years, and <clears throat> one of the things that was perhaps most remarkable to me was that early on, and I mean maybe 12 or 15 years ago, uh, how tough you were, how severe you were about your nonfiction, and how uh, uh, um, you, were, you were almost, I would go so far as to say, as your friend, very stubborn about seeing um, the subtle and not so subtle kinds of innovation and experimentation you were doing with that nonfiction and even disparaging about it at times. Well, and, um, but then, um, slowly, this evolution took place, and um, of, of recent years, you've talked more and more openly about, oh, I don't know, coming to terms with, coming to some balance with the notions that maybe the fiction and nonfiction, with the exception of a couple books that you did for, for other reasons, maybe more practical reasons, um, come from the same same places and the same concerns and the same. Um, but it occurred to me that the poignancy of that is that you've had to have worked through so much, not just personally, but actually written so much to get to that point of, of coming to terms with that. Well, yeah, I think that's true. I, you know, I began entirely as a fiction writer. I wrote three novels before I wrote nonfiction and a great many short stories. <clears throat> and, and none of this work was outstanding quality. Um, but nonetheless, this is really where my heart was, and I only went over to nonfiction to, to make a living. And uh, luckily, The New Yorker happened along, and everything worked out great. I didn't have to do that much. But I've always thought of my fiction as being the, the heart of my work, and I think I'm probably better known as a nonfiction writer. Uh, one, I'm in the ironic position. There's a book called The Snow Leopard, and, and I, I guess that's the, the book that I'm in a way, I wish it had never been written because um, I, it puts me in a pigeonhole of nonfiction that I have a trouble fighting my way out of. I think, I think critics, and especially lazy critics, are um, they don't want you to be in two different areas like that, and they want to they want to keep you in that one mode or the other, and they sort of suggest that you're, you know, playing at being a novelist. I don't I don't see that at all. I see right. exactly the opposite. Yeah. yeah, but but art, I mean, tr true art is always um, somehow armored against uh, convenient assessments of any sort, mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem to have, to have troubled you. I mean, on some level, because of the built-in chronology of the snow leopard, yeah. it would seem at first to almost be a traditional form, a diary form, almost following route. But within that, what was your thinking as you were writing it? Because I think it, it may be one of you, it certainly is one of amongst many of your best known books. I mean, you pushed certain limits in that book as well. Well, that book though, that one and, the, uh, and that one about New Guinea, yes. in a sense, they were kind of mythic books. They weren't, they didn't, I mean, they were, they were very exciting to write, unlike most nonfiction. For me, nonfiction is like, a carpentry, like craftsmanship, is like making a cabinet, whereas fiction is, you never know where it's going, and it's self-energizing. But the Snow Leopard, because of the extraordinary geographic circumstances and the sense of going back into time, every, you know, we walked 250 miles, and every 15 or 20 miles you went back another century, is the way it seemed, till we got to a place that could have been really there, you know, a thousand years ago people making all their own clothes, feeding themselves in this extraordinary Himalayan. And I remember I was with a very, very, very good fetal biologist, George Schaller, and I remember saying to Schaller about two or three weeks out, I said, if I can't get a good book out of this, I ought to be taken out and shot. Uh, and I really meant it. I thought this is just absolutely extraordinary, you know, what we were seeing. Yeah.
you know, wolves, tame, very tame wolves coming and watching wolves hunting. And, oh, just amazing. It's yeah. one extraordinary book. I, I have just one more thing, and then I think we, we, we can open it up. Um, and uh, we've talked about this before, but I think in terms of publishing and in terms of your particular writing life, if you don't mind, would you just tell again the, uh, the one of the more fascinating stories uh, about uh, Far Tortuga, its inception? Because this book, you initially uh, were supported by the New Yorker to go down to the Caribbean. But then, I mean, because this isn't a, a chance to talk about the actual inception, the actual beginning of a, of, of a, of a novel that took you to places that none of yeah. your previous work had taken you. I yeah. forgot how long you worked on that book, 10 years? That was about a 10 or 12 years, yeah. but it was such fun all the way. Yeah, way. yeah. But, but just, it was a new form. you know, the relationship to perseverance and, and just coming clean with, with then Mr. Sean at The New Yorker. Yeah, this happened, um, I, I read about it, and there's a wonderful book called The Windward Road, which I recommend to everybody who's interested in the Caribbean or, or nature by a herpetologist named um, Archie Carr, who now long gone. But he was searching the Caribbean for the nesting beaches of a thing called the Olive Ridley, Kemp's Ridley turtle. And they, no one knew where it bred, and they weren't trying to protect it because it was very scarce. And he went all around the Caribbean, to every island. What a, an assignment he had. And he spoke of this place called Grand Cayman, which at that time was not known at all. And he said there's a guy there who was still sailing down to the Nicaragua, to the Mosquito Keys, in search of green turtle. So I went to Mr. Sean at the New Yorker, and I said, Mr. Sean, this is a wonderful thing to sail on this schooner, and how about sponsoring me? Well, he, he did. But it took several years, because I was dealing with this pirate down there. you know. And I finally, after several years, I did actually sail on this turtle schooner. I went down off the Keys of Nicaragua. And I was stunned by it, because these guys, too, were working hundreds of years in the past. They had no life-saving equipment, no radio, no nothing. And they were doing very quite dangerous work in those trade winds on those reefs with no navigational aids of any kind, let alone a Coast Guard. And I was very impressed. And certain things happened. And I came back to New York, and I went to Mr. Sean, and I said, I'm very embarrassed. I know I've run up an expense account. I kind of pride myself on keeping my expense account down. and. Uh, I said, this one's higher than I wanted, but even worse, I said, I'm not going to give you the best material. I'm going to hold back. And I said, if you want to cancel the nonfiction piece, that's what they call a fact piece, I'll do my best to repay the, over the years, I'll repay the expenses, but I'm not going to give you the best material. I want to do a novel. I'm very, very excited about it. And Mr. Sean, God bless him, really, he, without any hesitation whatsoever, he said, Mr. Matheson, do what's best for your work. Well, tears practically arced out of my eyes. You know, I was so moved because I've been used to these bottom liners and all the magazines I've been having fights with all through the years. <laughs> and Sean was so wonderful. And I remember a few years ago, you may recall, he got booted out rather unceremoniously by the um, Newhouse people and replaced, and not politely either. And most of his writers, I think, probably wrote him. I did, and I said, Mr. Sean, you will have forgotten this episode, but I want to remind you, because it was my high point of, in dealing with editor ever in, a, in my magazine work. And uh, I got a very nice letter back from him. But anyhow, that, that shows you that that book could have gone as nonfiction, but I just sensed right away, this is fiction. This, this is so close to myth and legend and storytelling and everything, everything I wanted to do was there. And, um, and it's my own favorite of my books. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. I think you, enough, we'll open it up to the audience yeah. questions. They can get a yeah. chance to ask you. Hi. Oh. <laughs> House lights. Is that on? Well, I can just talk. No. Oh, okay. Good. There you go. Um, I'm one of the unfortunate people who knows you mostly as a nature writer, although I would consider myself fortunate for that. And um, I wanted to ask you something for a long time. Um, I find in myself the part of me that 
Uh, the environmentalist part of me seems to be at war with the creative part of me to some extent because caring about the natural world seems to me to mean finding what I love and then trying really hard to hold on to it and protect it, whereas um, working creatively entails standing back from things a bit and making myself available and not and reserving judgment and uh, being available to change, I guess. And uh, it, it bothers me. I mean, I feel like I, I, there's two parts of me, and I love them both. And, and they, and I'm just wondering, in your work, do you find a, a war between the novelist and the and the nature writer? And if not, I just wonder how do they fit together? Or is that is that even, not even a question for you? I don't know. Well. I did, I did have a kind of a war there for the reason that I was talking about. I felt I begrudged the nonfiction time. I felt if I didn't have a wife and children to support, I wouldn't be doing it. I'd be doing nothing but fiction. And then really it was a, a painter, a friend of mine who was a painter. He said, why are you always putting down your nonfiction? He said, you know, you, in a way you're doing the same thing with both of them. You're still writing about, a lot about wildlife. You're writing about traditional people. It is a kind of elegiac um, approach. And so I just sort of did it after that. And I also I think that uh, I feel very strongly that right, you know, Albert Camus, when he got the Nobel Prize, he said this wonderful thing. And he said that in the 20th century, and he was making a distinction between the 20th and the 19th, he said writers can no longer sort of be in their garret. He said that, you, uh, he said it's the obligation of 20th century writers to, quote, speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And uh, I feel that, you know, very strongly. There are things crying to be defended or attacked, as the case may be, um, out there. And, I, and I, so now I'm, I'm rather glad that I've spent uh, as much time as I have, you know, working with social justice and those kind of things and the environment and so forth. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it feels okay now, but for a while it was a big fight, just like you're talking about. I welcome your reference to your artistic work as ordering your life, but I was surprised that there was no reference at all to your Zen practice in that respect. Um, well, nobody asked about Zen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was very Zen of me not to refer to it. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I certainly my Zen practice has been a big um, steadying influence and, and uh, I think, you know, uh, calming and um, yeah, I can't, I, I don't want to get into Zen because I don't want to speak particularly superficially about it and we haven't got a great deal of time, but I am a Zen student and um, still am, I'm very happy to be there and uh, <coughs> thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, you know, actually, curiously, I did for a while con uh, consider a, a sequel. I wanted to bring Lewis Moon back as a hero and show what became of him. Uh, and then I got derailed by something else. That, that, this is a novel that takes place in um, South America, and I'd gone down there for The New Yorker. I wrote a book called uh, The Cloud Forest about wilderness travel in South America. And I knew, uh, but I, South America, fascinated me so much. And then I went on another expedition to New Guinea. But New Guinea, geographically, and the land and the history didn't interest me, even though it was fascinating Stone Age people and everything. But still, uh, South America has a kind of a violence and a mystery and an atmosphere that attracted me. So I did this novel down there um, based on conflicts with missionary people who were, you know, having a, a terrible impact on the traditional tribes people there. Um, so that's really how that, uh, that came about. Um, Would you say what, what you thought would happen to Lewis Moon when he came back? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd posed a quandary for myself because Lewis Moon at the very end, you remember he's, he's just naked, he's just traveling down this river all by himself, and it's a good question whether he ever 
whether he survives or not. And I guess I came around to the view <laughs> it's easier to let him go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I never worked that out philosophically. I think what happened was that I got off on Far Tortuga, and then and the next thing I knew, I was into this terrifying Watson <laughs> business, and um, I just never went back, and probably just as well. Probably just as, I did go back to Amer working with American Indian people a lot, but in, in nonfiction, yeah. But they've always been, from my very first novel, um, there's always been Indian people. There's always been an Indian character, fiction or nonfiction, in almost every book. Um, Something I've admired tremendously is your work on the use of oral history, um, uh, the voices of people you've talked about, both in fiction and nonfiction. And I think uh, in some places, in uh, possibly the same works or some of your other writing about Indians, uh, you talk about the difficulty of talking to and you know, getting the, the voices and stories of people who are intrinsically going to start out mistrusting you because you're a white man, because of where you come from, and you're a writer, and you're many things that uh, they're not inclined to trust. And I wonder if that's, there's a, been a learning process for you that you could talk about, about how, how you how you learn to approach people in those situations. Yes, it has been a learning process. You know, in our society, it, we are very sociable, we Americans. We need to be liked, and we, we tend to get immediately as we can, as fast as we can on a first name basis. <laughs> how, how are you, Fred? And, you, know, uh, you know, and a lot of these societies don't see it quite that way. American Indian people, for example, who are wonderful friends and, and humorous and great fun to be with, but at first, they just mainly don't like you. They don't trust you, and they have very good reason not to trust you, and they just don't much like you. And um, I think all of us should have the experience of spending some time in a minority household where you're not liked, where you are the unpopular minority. Um, it's very, very humbling at first. And I can remember, I remember very well where I went into an Indian house in um, Undundi, and the guy who, who brought me there was a very well-liked Indian himself. So when I, I went in with him and people were still cold, I knew how bad it was. And we all sat down at this table, and um, everybody was served coffee except for me. There wasn't a big show about it, just somehow. And then we, and maybe 15, 20 minutes into the conversation, somebody cracked a joke, and I laughed. And they, they saw that I really was laughing. I was really amused, you know, kind of thing. I was. It was funny. Somebody said something very funny. And the next thing I knew, this coffee cup appeared <laughs> at my... So somehow the, the walls start to break down, and a, a Indian people feel, well, you know, if we like, if we like you, that, that'll happen, but we don't have to like you at once, which is sort of in our, our society. And I've had this in, in, even in Florida. I mean, these people I've been working with in Florida, they're backcountry people who've been sort of pushed out by the society and so forth, and they have no reason to like me. I'm an A, a Yankee, B, I'm a communist by their standards, and um, my politics, my origins, everything about me is suspicious. And it takes a long time, and you just have to be patient and sweat it out. And um, see, now, you know, the other day I went down there and Lost Man's River was out. The first book came out about four or five years ago called Killing Mr. Watson. And I don't make any bones about the fact that, in my view, there's a terrible racism in that part of the country. There is. Uh, and they know I think so. And Lost Man's River, in a sense, is worse. It's harder on him even than killing Mr. Watson. <laughs> so when I went down there, the, I the, was being interviewed by the Miami Herald, and they took me over there to Chukalusky to, to shoot pictures and interview me and stuff. And I thought, maybe I'll get lynched just to make a, you know, a grabber headline. Um, and I thought, really, I might run into some trouble. Well, fortunately for me, the, you know, people don't read a great deal, so there was only one lady who was <laughs> halfway through the book. It was still pretty new. <laughs> but while I was there, a funny thing happened. A guy came up very quietly, and not very hospitably, but he says, as you come over to, to Nell's restaurant, she says she wants to give you a little bit of lunch. You know, and so I did, and I took the photographer over, and the photographer was a black guy, and they, you know, they're still very funny about that, but they were extremely courteous, very polite, and we all went in there. And while I was sitting there having lunch, 
about five or six men came up to me and rather tersely. He says, you know what you said about our, our kind of people? He says, well, you got it right. This is exactly what my daddy told me and my granddaddy too. And you got it right. You did your work. And that's really what they wanted to say. And I felt, well, great. Because no matter what I say in this Lost Man's River, they're not going to like it. But they know I didn't do it lightly. I took my time and I did my homework. And I know these stories. And they, they're not going to be able to deny them. They may not care for them. Some, I mean, some are fine. Some of these people are really, they're way ahead of the others in terms of being open-minded, but some of them aren't. But they're very honest. I really, I like these folks. I never thought I could like people as much as I do these people. They're very gritty and they're tough and they're funny. And uh, I admire them. I admire their endurance, really. They've been pushed out of existence by the Everglades National Park, really, and other things. Sorry, I don't mean to make these long-winded answers here. Well, I don't know. I, I, thank you. I, I like, um, I, I, tend, I just like traditional people. They have a great deal to teach us. And so to say whether I like Sherpa or Inuit people or American Indian people, Hopi, I, I've just um, been exposed and I feel very fortunate that I have. I've made good friends and good contacts and I just, I like the way these people work and I think they have a lot to teach us. I don't mean to get into a kind of a sentimental you know, we, we tend to get into a kind of a sentimental thing about traditional people, especially American Indians. We say you know, they're either drunken slobs or they're environmental gurus who can save the world. And what they really are are folks, just like us. They're all pink on the inside, you know. And I think that they, they don't like being put in these uh, either romantic or sentimental categories or these defamatory ones. Uh, they are just people, but they do know a lot. And they, knew, they, and they know a lot that we used to know and have forgotten. I think that's a very, you, you see that. You know that our older societies had some of these insights and wisdom too. And, uh, and I also know lots of Indian people who are bastards, you know. And they don't mind, they laugh when you say that. They know it's true, they know who they are. They're just like us. They, some of them have a great sense of humor and some don't. And uh, some are wonderful people and some are not. Um, I just wanted to tell you that uh, The Snow Leopard has been one of the most meaningful books I've ever read, but I almost want to apologize. <laughs> no, no. Don't listen to me. I'm prejudiced. Uh, <laughs> but it's interesting to hear you talk about that, you know, sort of the dilemma between the creative ambition and, and nonfiction. And for somebody who's an avid nonfiction reader, I've always you know, admired the ability to you know, choose a series, be able to go from one form to the other. You mean in making the decision between one and the other? No, I mean in, in the, actual, uh, the actual execution of the writing. Mm -hmm. uh, are there different qualities that you're expecting of yourself, you know, depending on the form? And do you feel, uh, I know that you, you, know, you obviously said that it's preferences, but what do you feel that uh, your, your, uh, your comfort level and your ability are? Well, if I, if I understand you correctly, I... I I am very, I'm very harsh, and I'm rather perfectionist in my stuff, and I'm, I'm apt to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, which is why I spend 24 hours a day writing practically and, and turning out all this junk. But uh, I know that the last chapter, the last part of uh, a play in the Fields of the Lord, which is this solitary river trip, I rewrote, rewrote entirely. I mean, really worked on it about 30 times to get it the way I wanted it. And even then, it wasn't the way I wanted, but you know, you work on something long enough, it's like if you've ever, I don't know if you, anybody who's baked bread will know what I'm talking about. When you're, when you're working the dough, you're just using the crude, the flour and everything, and then as you work it, the bread starts to come to life. It becomes this kind of flexible 
sinuous thing, but you keep on working it, and what happens? It gets crumbly and brittle and falls apart. And I think that can happen very easily with, with, with prose. You can overwork it. When I read, most things I read, I, I wish the writer had done one more draft. I see sloppiness that doesn't have to be there. But I had this, we had, I have a joke with one of my best friends who's a very good, excellent writer. And it's possible to do one draft too many. Um, you can kill it that way. And you can't get it back uh, once that happens. It's a deadness. That's Zen. <laughs> yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, interesting question. This is a book called Under the Mountain Wall. Um, it, it never, you know, was just one of my least known books. Um, if you can find a copy, it's it was it's beautifully done, beautifully designed. This was an expedition to New Guinea. Michael Rockefeller was with us, and you remember he was killed. He disappeared out there. He was killed by people, and um, it was, and and the New Yorker sponsored me as per usual. But when I got out there and I saw this is absolutely extraordinary Stone Age situation. These people were going to war once a week, and the incredible customs. And we were just absolutely dazzled, but it really was Stone Age. I mean, stone tools and everything, no metal or anything. And uh, I thought, I don't want to come in here like the big old expedition. I said, what a wonderful chance to describe this just the way it is, just sort of like a fly on the wall. And so we, I just sort of stayed out of the book entirely. Uh, I thought it was a great approach. <clears throat> Mr. Sean didn't care for it. The New Yorker likes a guide to the reader to help them through this weird experience. And so the New Yorker never did that uh, a book, but it was, uh, I felt it was the way to, to approach it. And I, I like that book better than a lot of my others. <laughs> I think we uh, should stop. Maybe we should stop, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs>